Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at NATO's new headquarters in Brussels, where we're interviewing some of the senior leaders from the alliance. And we're honored to have with us uh, Oana Lungescu, uh, who's the spokes spokeswoman uh, of the alliance, the chief uh, strategic communications advisor to Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, uh, and also a former uh, reporter. So this has been great because Antonio was a former reporter as well. There you go. Um, pleasure, uh, pleasure having you. So, it, it, you know, we live in a very, very dynamic environment, certainly when it comes to communications. You know, I mean, I, I started in the pre-social media era. I started in the pre-internet era, really, uh, where you actually had to make a lot of phone calls and look for faxes, and there were still late man duties that you had to pull, uh, which I know that you uh, remember mm -hmm. doing uh, mm -hmm. as well. But now the environment is such where uh, a lie really can make it around the world, you know, before the truth gets its shoes on, as, as Mark Twain was, was fond of saying. Talk to us about this landscape, um, where the media environment is going, where the communications environment is going, because one of the most powerful tools is still communications, both for good guys and for bad guys. Talk to us about the landscape, where you see opportunities and where you see potential pitfalls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like you, I started as a journalist and I, I can see the difference, you know, from the 25 years I spent in my previous life working for the BBC to where we are now. And I think uh, the, uh, the changes, the disruption uh, are accelerating, uh, if anything. Um, I think for, for us in NATO, we've always had to deal with disinformation. That's always been part part of the job as it were um, but we have seen um, an industrial scale increase in disinformation especially since 2014 the illegal annexation of Crimea by Russia so uh, from then on we have seen a spike in disinformation and in uh, adversarial narratives directed towards NATO uh, there's a, there are of course a lot of other state and non-state actors out there engaged in similar activities. Um, but for us, this has been the main, the main focus and the main concern. And we can see now, uh, looking back, uh, that the aims of Russian disinformation um, about NATO, but also about our countries in general, um, are multifold. They're not, the aim is not to convince but to confuse uh, it's to undermine trust uh, in in our democratic societies and processes and institutions uh, to divide uh, both nations internally but to divide America from Europe and Europeans among themselves and ultimately uh, to prevent us from taking action so to delay or stop us from taking any meaningful decisions because we'll be so confused that we don't know what's going on, we don't know what is true, what is not true, uh, and that will undermine our ability to act. But if you're one of, one of the things which uh, Alliance members, and I think uh, the Secretary General is even on the record, that um, we don't want to use the tactics of our adversaries. We're not ever going to lie because we're always going to use the truth, mm -hmm. which is the most powerful tool. Uh, and there's no assailing the morality nor the correctness of that message. But ultimately, how do you do this? How do you show publics that are susceptible sometimes to social media manipulation, as we saw, have seen in elections across, uh, whether in the United States or across Europe, um, the active undermining in institutions, whether the European Union or NATO in particular, which Russia regards both as adversaries. You know, how do you do that functionally um, to, to make sure that you're not destabilized, the alliance itself isn't destabilized, or key members of the alliance aren't destabilized by these active measures? First, we don't fight propaganda with more propaganda because uh, that would mean that uh, we would only confirm the Russian narrative that there is no such thing as truth. Uh, there are only shades of grey uh, and different versions of reality, depending on who you are and where you stand. So I think we need to have trust uh, that ultimately the truth will prevail. But of course, it's not just about truth, it's also about emotion. And a lot 
uh, a lot of what we see is exploiting our own vulnerabilities and expl exploiting sometimes our own folly um, or our own lack of attention. Uh, so a lot of it is about ourselves. It's not just about what others do or say about us. It's primarily what we do, uh, what we choose to do, how we choose to, to behave and to react. So for us in NATO, I see basically five key functions. Uh, awareness. We need to know what's happening out there, so we, we monitor uh, very, very closely. Um, analysis. We analyse hostile narratives about NATO, for instance, related to specific deployments, uh, say, our battle groups in the, in the Baltics. Um, then counter-messaging. We need to push back uh, when we see uh, serious uh, disinformation out there, but we don't have the resources uh, to deal with every lie that is out there, and of course there are lots. So we need to actually focus on the key messages, on the key myths that we push back on. And for that, for instance, we have developed uh, a website portal called Setting the Record Straight, which sort of catalogues uh, and rebuts uh, the main myths uh, that Russia has developed uh, about, uh, about NATO, because they remain fairly stable, fa fairly consistent. Um, then uh, we need to communicate with confidence. And that, I think, is the most important thing that we have to do. It's not just to rebut what the others do, because that sometimes risks uh, reinforcing uh, the disinformation. We need to be very clear about who we are, uh, what we do, why we do what, what we do. Uh, and uh, fifth, it's coordination. Because it's not just going to be us in NATO headquarters where we have, frankly, uh, fairly limited resources, uh, both in the press office and in the public diplomacy division uh, as a whole. We have under 100 people in the public diplomacy uh, division and under 30 uh, in the press office. Um, so we need to be uh, part of a whole network, uh, and we do have a huge network, because after all, we are an alliance of 29 democracies. Uh, so we work very closely uh, with the allies to amplify, to leverage uh, what we do, and also beyond. We work very closely with the European Union, for instance, uh, with think tanks, uh, with think tankers and, and influencers. So we, we try to, to create alliances uh, to, uh, so that we can together amplify the truth. But if you look at a fake video, for example, right, if folks for years have been talking about that's really going to be the game-changing mm. technology. And very recently, there was a fake uh, video of the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, uh, showing her to be uh, drunk. Um, that was seen repeatedly in social media. Um, national, uh, the President of the United States sort of played a role in that and um, helping distribute that video and, and giving it a little bit of credence, you know, even though ultimately it was taken down. A message like that, you can argue all you want about the facts of it, but at the end of the day, that re will remain in the minds of some people a reality. How do you, in a real-time basis, fight this battle, especially with, you know, it's one thing to read something that's a false narrative. It's another thing to see a picture, for example, that could be miscaptioned um, to give you the wrong impression. But then in that case, it's a, it's a very expertly manipulated video that seems very real. So now you've got the you know, you're hearing it, you're seeing it, and you go, well, I mean, you're, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. How do you fight that, especially in a real-time manner, where there could be a lot of other things going on in the background that this is intended to distract attention? Like, let's say whether it's a, a it, you know, a fake video, for example, it will only be a matter of time of the Secretary General. We haven't seen that, um, but of course, uh, deep fakes. Uh, are an issue that I know are of concern to, to many, including, uh, including myself. And I also know that there's a lot of work being done uh, both by, by scientists um, and uh, 
uh, also by, uh, by, by the big uh, tech companies. Because in the end, again, it's not going to be you know, the NATO spokesperson who's going to be dealing with this individually. It takes uh, a, a lot of cooperation between, you know, it's, it's a whole of government approach in the end and a whole of society approach. And we need to come back to, to who we are as human beings. And, you know, sometimes we can be very smart, sometimes we, 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 we can be a bit silly. So we, we need to uh, not believe everything that, that we see. We need to check our sources. Uh, and from that point of view, I think a free and independent media uh, remains key to a democratic society and to a society uh, that sticks to, to its own values. Um, and it has to be the journalists that, that ask the tough questions and check their sources. Uh, and it's the same now, I think, for every citizen, because we're all digital citizens these days, there has to be greater digital literacy, greater media literacy, uh, so that people don't just believe everything they see uh, on some social media account. Uh, well, I, I appreciate the endorsement, especially coming from somebody who was born uh, in, in what was the Warsaw uh, uh, Pact, where, uh, you know, official information sources, I think, uh, you know, almost everybody behind the Iron Curtain was pretty skeptical of official information mm -hmm. sources and what they were telling them, uh, which I think is so funny about how folks want to sort of go back to that. Uh, yeah, but I a think a bit. healthy dose of skepticism is, is always good, uh, you know, regardless uh, of our which society we, we live in. So I, I would say encouraging skepticism is, uh, is good, but also encouraging trust in, in our institutions that have served us so, so well. Uh, since uh, since the end of the, the Cold War. And, and also going with reputable news sources is, 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 a, is another uh, core uh, element of it. How do you, how would you grade um, w without, without trying to be tough or put you on the spot, right? But how would you grade how well um, the Alliance is doing in at least getting its message out. Uh, because I know that you guys in um, the big Trident Juncture exercise had a media module of information disinformation. How, how would you gauge how well the Alliance is doing in, in, in operating in this contested space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Trident Juncture was, uh, was an interesting case in point because, of course, it was uh, NATO's biggest exercise since the end uh, of the Cold War. Uh, and it took place uh, at the end of last year, mainly in Norway, but uh, also in, in Iceland and uh, with the support of Finland and Sweden. Uh, so it was a, a big exercise which showed NATO as a defensive organization, but also one that is ready uh, and that works with, with partners. And those were our main messages. Um, we analyzed uh, and tracked very closely uh, the, the Russian narratives, and uh, they were not very inventive. Um, there were two narratives. One, NATO is aggressive. Two, uh, NATO is weak. Of course, these are contradictory uh, narratives which were run concurrently, uh, again, in an attempt to confuse. So uh, we calibrated our messaging to, to stress the defensive nature of what we did. And also we were careful uh, not to escalate tensions when the Russians, for instance, uh, announced that they were going to test missiles in the area of the exercise. So we said uh, it's their right to do so. We will remain vigilant, but we're not changing the nature of our exercise or anything that we do. And overall, um, we had the, the biggest, uh, broadest, and I would say most positive uh, media coverage uh, of any exercise and of any activity that NATO did last year, with the exception uh, of the NATO summit in Brussels in, in July, which of course attracted a lot of media attention. And uh, that was again done by, by leveraging both uh, the civilian and the military uh, communicators. It was very important, that's a key part of what NATO does. And not just talking about uh, what we were doing, but showing it and, and doing it, because words have to be backed by deeds, otherwise we're not, we're not credible. Um, so 
I think we were, uh, we were pretty effective with our home audiences, which were uh, our main target. Uh, I think it remains very difficult for us uh, to measure any impact uh, among the Russian publics. Uh, so that's where I think we all need to try to do better. But of course, we're dealing in a very contested uh, information environment, uh, which is uh, controlled uh, almost 99% uh, by the Russian authorities. So let me ask you two questions. One is, um, in the environment that we're living in, NATO still is remarkably popular with the European public and indeed popular in the United States. But there is a very, very powerful backlash in Europe against multinational organizations. The EU is bearing the brunt of it, but the NATO is also a multinational institution at the end of the day. And one in which, is, as we've discussed, Russia is very actively trying to undermine both of them. It's, it's not just undermining one, but then also trying to undermine specifically each of the governments to try to weaken uh, support for these institutions among, among publics. Are you worried about that? Is that a concern of yours that actually the, the public NATO exists to serve could actually turn on the organization itself? Actually, what we've seen is that uh, public support for NATO has grown and in some of our member states has grown significantly uh, because NATO has been perceived as being uh, agile enough to adapt to what is now a very challenging environment. And in the last uh, few years, we have seen the biggest adaptation of our collective defence uh, since the end of the Cold War in, in a generation. And I think one of our uh, aims, of course, is to reassure uh, our citizens that NATO will be there to deter any threat and to defend all allies. Uh, and uh, that is also uh, the key part uh, of one of our communications campaigns, hashtag we are NATO. Um, and we see a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest, a lot of support uh, for that. But of course, we also know that there is an underlying trend uh, of distrust of institutions. And that is exactly what actors like Russia uh, are trying to, uh, to, to use. Um, because uh, they are trying to undermine the rules-based order that, that we have built. So that's why we need to remain uh, vigilant. But we also see a lot of mobilization when, uh, when needed. I'll give you an example. Um, around the time of exercise trident juncture towards the end on a Sunday as it happened the uh, the Russian embassy in London which is one of the disinformation hubs I'm afraid um, uh, that that Russia uses to pump out uh, a lot of social media disinformation came out uh, with uh, a couple of tweets um, misrepresenting our presence in the Baltics and other things that NATO is doing. So I push back uh, with, with a tweet uh, setting the record straight uh, with a certain um, level of irony to it, but also tagging uh, a lot of uh, media outlets, journalists, think tankers, getting in touch um, with, with our allies. And in the end, uh, the original Russian tweet had some 700 comments. Um, however, most of them were negative or ironic or debunking the original Russian claim. So we assessed, and that was also an assessment that the EU did, because they also looked uh, into this particular series of tweets, uh, that we had actually won uh, the battle in the information space on that particular occasion, because we had all stood together uh, and pushed back uh, against what was very egregious disinformation. And, and that's really... So it can be done. And, and that's the key, right, is that everybody does it together. Absolutely. It, I think the message is it can be done if we do it together, uh, if we remain vigilant, uh, and uh, if we stick to our values. Do, does that become a, a more challenging task if you also have national leaders, I mean, there are some uh, right of center national leaders or, or national leaders who do go along with some of this messaging. Does it become harder to do if 
you do have that coordination, but then, you know, senior leaders, whether, uh, I don't want to make any name, mention any names, but right, you know, whether it's the president of the United States or whether it's an Erdogan or whether it's, um, you know, Orban gets involved with it with a different narrative, does that make it more complicated to counter some of these messaging? Look, NATO is an alliance of 29 democracies and democracies choose different political leaders. We have different political parties, different political traditions, uh, different histories. Uh, and yeah, we have debates and we have differences. But at the end of the day, uh, we all agree on the core mission of NATO, which is that we defend and protect each other. So uh, we see that the diversity and the, the differences in our democracies uh, is actually a source of strength, not of weakness. Let me ask you a last question, and that is, uh, you're the first journalist to hold this job as a spokesperson. Well done. And Always. the first woman. And the first woman to hold this job as, as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes said that, you know, former journalists make the best spokesman or they make the worst uh, spokesman. How do you think that it's helped you ultimately being a reporter and being in this job? I think it's, it's important to continue to ask the dumb questions. Uh, I always ask, what does this acronym actually mean? Sometimes because I don't know, sometimes because I want to uh, compel my, my colleagues to actually spell out what they mean. Thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> I think it's really important that we do, because if we, we can't communicate amongst ourselves, how will we be able to communicate uh, with the rest of the world, people who may not know or care about NATO? So I think it is our duty as an international organization and as an alliance uh, that is there to, to protect uh, all our one, one billion uh, citizens to be as clear, as transparent uh, about what we say and, and what we mean as we possibly can. As a journalist, obviously, uh, you know, I will always be a journalist at, at heart. So I, I keep those instincts of being both an insider and, and an outsider uh, at the same time to try to translate sometimes the decisions which can be uh, quite complicated. But as I say, at the end of the day, this is in about making sure that all our citizens can go about living their lives in peace, in freedom. So it's about maintaining our way of life. That's what NATO is all about. Juan Langescu, uh, NATO, uh, NATO's uh, spokeswoman, and I want to thank you. Your team's done a terrific job uh, taking care of us. We really, really appreciate it and look forward to visiting with you again. Thank you very much, Vago. You're very welcome to, to come back.